here. There we go, we are now recording. And welcome to those of you joining us on YouTube now as well. My name is Jamie Vivak, and I'm the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. Just a little bit of housekeeping to get us started here. First off, everybody's muted, your cameras are off. If you're joining us in your pajamas or um, you know, in, enjoying a beverage or whatever as well, no judgment here. Um, you can see us, we can't see you, should all be good. So this webinar is going to be recorded for everyone to enjoy later. All of our past webinars are saved to our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for The Conservation Foundation and you'll find our page that has all of our good stuff saved on there. So lots of really great past webinars, um, lots of really good information on there. Uh, if you're looking to start bird watching or you want to ID some plants, whatever, lots of really great information there. So. Uh, during the webinar, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box that lets everybody see your questions and it also makes it easier for us to find them all. Questions can sometimes get lost in the chat, um, but I'll do our best to uh, get them all to Leah at the very end of the presentation. So um, I'm, if you have a quick little question here or there that I can answer, I may answer it to you in the chat, but um, we'll save all the big questions for Leah for the end. So for your safety, you should only be able to see anything that I post in the chat, but just in case I missed a setting, please don't click any links other than what Leah or I may post there. On the TCF side of things, these webinars are offered to the public for free, but we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. The more people we have attending, the more it does cost us to run them. So at the end of the webinar, you'll be taken to a page with a whole bunch of resources for things you might be interested in. Um, our butterfly brochure, our rain garden brochure, our native plant brochure, all kinds of really great stuff there, but you'll also have our virtual tip jar. So please consider offering a donation or um, along with your donation, you can also click the button to become a member as well. And then you can take advantage of all of our members only stuff. So we've been doing these webinars once a week um, for starting in August. So I can't believe August is over already. This is our last August webinar. So next week, September 2nd, we will be joined again by our good TCF friend, Nancy, who will be talking about oaks. And you know, of course I love the puns. So oaks are a oak K will be our topic next week. And the week after that, I'm super excited because we have some friends joining us with their own special guests. They will be uh, presenting on Illinois raptors, the birds, not the dinosaurs. I'm always very quick to clarify that. So um, they will have some live birds to introduce us to along the way. So I'm super excited about that one. That one's gonna be really awesome. So make sure you join us next week to talk about oaks and September 9th as we talk about raptors. So now that we have that out of the way, I'm going to invite Leah to turn on her microphone and her camera. There she Hello. is. And I am going to turn it over to Leah. Okay. Our Where communications master. Can you see my screen and everything? Yep, you're all good. Great. So hello everyone. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Leah Rodberry. I am a communication specialist at the Conservation Foundation, which means that I just create all different kinds of media to help support our work to protect local land and protect local rivers. So I end up doing a lot of graphic design, photography, videos, writing. And today I'm going to share with you some nature photography basics. So if you're looking to improve your nature photography, you've come to the right place because I'm going to share how you can frame your shot to make it look more interesting tips for getting proper exposure, and we'll talk briefly about photo editing, um, and I'm really excited to get started. So why nature photography? Um, there are several reasons. Nature photography can just be a really great creative outlet and a way to flex your artistic muscles. It can also encourage you to get outside more or just serve as a companion to being outside. And if you just wanna get outside, take pictures, enjoy nature and reap the health benefits of nature while you're at it, I think that's incredible. 
And it can also be used to share your experiences of nature. So maybe you've just set up a beautiful butterfly garden and now you have all these monarchs flocking to your yard and you want to share that with your friends and family. Taking a picture of that makes sense. And uh, it can also be a tool to help spread awareness. Photography can be really powerful to send a message. And if you're taking pictures of local nature, it can help boost support to protect our local land, rivers, and wildlife. That's the why of nature photography. Um, but now we're gonna talk about the how. This is a picture of me. Um, a lot of people ask, like, do I really need a fancy camera? Or can I just take pictures with my phone? And I always like to say that the best camera is the one you have. That you don't need to go buy something fancy to take great nature photos with, as long as you kind of understand some tips for taking good pictures, you have good light, and you have an interesting subject, you can take a great picture. But there are pros and cons to both. So with a phone, it's, I think Jamie mentioned it, it's just, it's something she always has. It's really small and portable. And so if you're just going on an impromptu hike and you didn't bring your bigger camera, you know, you can take a picture with your phone and still get a great picture. And now the technology with smartphones is getting better and better. I'm so impressed with some just phone pictures that you're sacrificing less these days. But at the same time, you do have less control over your settings. We're gonna talk a little bit about aperture and shutter, which for most phones, you really can't control that. And also um, sometimes being able to zoom in uh, is really important for nature photography if you're taking pictures of birds or insects that are far away. Um, with phones, it's mostly a digital zoom. And so the more you zoom in, you kind of see it get more pixelated. And then the same thing when you shoot, when it's darker outside, you get that grain a lot sooner. With a specialized camera for photography, these are sometimes called DSLRs, or maybe you have a film camera, which it didn't seem like anyone did. Uh, but also, digital cameras kind of fall in between. Some digital cameras, you can adjust the aperture and shutter, but others are pretty autom automatic, too. But with a DSLR or a specialized photo camera, you should be able to adjust all these settings so you have complete control over how the photo looks. And then you can also have interchangeable lenses, which really help you get the exact shot you want if you have something in mind. Like you can see here, I have this um, big zoom lens on my camera that helps me zoom in. Or I, you could put a macro lens on, which is something that helps you focus really close up. So if you're taking a picture of flowers or an insect, that lens would come in handy. They do have um, little lenses that you can kind of attach to your phone. I've seen those with macro, um, little macro lenses. So that's kind of an in-between. If you have a phone and kind of want to get better at nature photography, and, but don't want to invest all the money, which is one of the cons of a specialized camera is that it is more expensive and then it's bulky. But you're, you, like sometimes I just do like to go hiking and I don't want the weight of the camera on me because I just want to enjoy nature. But then I see something that I want to take a picture of, that's the case where I might use my phone. And if you are using your phone, you can still get great pictures. I was just taking a walk this spring and I saw some trout lilies because I, I love spring ephemerals. And so this is the picture of a trout lily that I took. And what's also nice about phones, they're so small. So a trout lily is maybe like three, four inches tall. And so I had to get really low. And so with a phone, you're able to just kind of get it underneath that trout lily that has this nodding head you can kind of see, and then those recurved petals. So I was able to get in and under to see more of the flower. And so that's something that would probably be a little bit more difficult with a big bulky camera. So now we've talked a little bit about equipment and I'm gonna share with you some steps to taking a great nature photo so you can start improving your photos. Good pictures uh, tend to have a few things. For instance, you can clearly tell what the subject is. It's gonna have a clear separation between the subject and the background, and then it's going to be properly exposed, so it's not going to be too dark or too bright. It's the 
bright amount of light that you see a lot of detail. And then it will also have a well-considered composition, which is the first thing we'll talk about. Composition, it's also the framing of your shot. How can you put the subject in the frame so that it looks its absolute best? And there are so many different ways that you can frame your subject. So here I took a picture of a turkey tail mushroom. I love mushrooms. And so the first one, it's taken it's kind of from the side. It has a very different look than if I'm taking it from overhead. So composition, it can just be um, where it physically is in that frame. So if it's in like the upper left hand corner, but I also consider it like what your perspective is if you're low or if you're at an angle or maybe if you're shooting overhead. So um, there are several composition rules or guidelines. The most notable, I would say, is the rule of thirds. And I think this is a great one to start out with. So the rule of thirds it basically means placing your subject or focal point in a third of the frame. And so this becomes easier to explain if we draw lines going horizontally in thirds and vertically in thirds. So hopefully you can see this grid now. Um, simply, uh, it can just be like this queen of the prairie here on the left, um, putting the in focus one on this line that cuts through one third of the image. Or with landscape photography, it might be putting your horizon line on that horizontal third line, like in this picture of these spruce trees. Or you can put your focal point at the area or the, where the two lines intersect. For some reason, our eyes tend to be drawn to these areas of that intersection. And so in this picture that my coworker Jennifer took of a chorus frog, that's how it's framed and I think it looks great. Then after maybe considering the rule of thirds, you also wanna look at what's in your background. This is really gonna help your subject pop and be really clear. So there's two examples of um, different kinds of backgrounds here. I um, love for some reason shag bark hickory trees when they leaf out. To me, they just kind of look alien and fun. So I was taking a bunch of pictures of them. And so at first uh, I was taking this picture on the left and I noticed, oh, there's kind of a lot going on in the background. There's all these different trees. And so it's still clear. You can still see that shag bark hickory leafing out. Um, but then I decided if I shift myself more, I can get a clean background. I framed it in between these two trees. And so now with this lighter, cleaner background, the little leaves are really standing out a lot more. So when you're thinking about the background, go try for something cleaner. Uh, but it can also be, maybe you might want to use color as well. So in these two pictures, both the backgrounds are kind of clean. It's of a honeybee on a butterfly weed. And it's the same honeybee, same butterfly weed, but I just shifted myself. So in one, um, we're seeing other plants in the background. And then in the one on the right, I'm seeing the sky in the background. And the reason why I like the second one more is because the butterfly weed and the honeybee are a bright orange. And then the blue sky it contrasts. They're blue and orange are contrasting colors, so it pops a lot more. And then having three colors, the blue, the green, and the orange, versus just the orange and the green, I think it's a lot more dynamic. So what I did in those pictures is I moved myself to get a different background. You don't necessarily need to find a whole new subject. It might just be, but you might just need to get some perspective. So you can be walking along a path, see something you want to take a picture of, and you could just stand and take it like I am in this first picture, or maybe try crouching down, taking like kneeling a little bit, or even getting really low, lying on your stomach if you're super dedicated to your craft. Uh, or here I'm just kind of holding my camera lower and I have a flip out screen that still lets me see it. But um, you can also then get lower, higher, you can rotate yourself too for different backgrounds. And to demonstrate the difference, 
So here's a royal catchfly I found. It is kind of dying because I took it last week just for demonstration purposes, but you can see the difference. In this first one, I just was standing, looking down, taking a picture of this flower. And I'm getting other plants that are also low to the ground. It's dark because I'm getting the soil as well as the shadows that the, um, the plants are casting. And then because the royal catchfly and the other plants nearby it, they're all kind of similar heights. They're in the same plane. So everything's more in focus and there's a lot more clutter. Versus if I'm squatting, kneeling down, and I'm more eye level with my subject, in this case, I can see the sky, it's lighter. So the subject is now more separated from the background. And because the plants around it are now at different depths, the background is also falling out of focus. So that's something I want you to try is find something you wanna take a picture of, take a picture of it one way, and then maybe think, can I move myself and see if maybe now shifting that will make the background better or make it a more dynamic shot? And then uh, still on the same line is, I, I encourage you also to get low. I think that's one of my favorite things to do specifically in nature photography because I tend to take a lot of pictures of plants. I'm a plant person. And so if you're taking pictures of plants, if you're taking pictures of insects or other things low to the ground, try getting down on eye level with it. It's gonna make a really interesting perspective um, with these wild leeks on the left. Like I'm seeing other plants in the foreground um, and you're just, I don't know, it's a cool perspective. And also with this, these oak leaves and oak trees in the background, the camera is pretty much, I remember taking it, I was like, the camera was almost in the leaves. And so that's why you get this kind of cool sense of depth. Speaking of sense of depth, um, creating a sense of depth or having a really strong foreground, midground, and background is another way to make a lot more dynamic images. And this picture on the left, I took it with my iPhone and in the foreground we see a wild geranium, the midground Virginia bluebells, and in the background some red buds. And that's just more interesting. My eye is first drawn to what's in focus and then um, kind of heads backwards through the frame. And here's an example of maybe a limitation that comes with taking a picture with a smartphone is that you have less control um, over what's in focus. So I think I would like those Virginia bluebells to be a little bit more in focus so I can see some more detail. And with a DSLR or a camera that I could control the aperture, um, I could make that a little more in focus. On a phone, um, you usually can't. I know now with like the newest iPhones, you can like control the blur of the background, but what it's doing like a, a digital kind of blur where it's using like AI to like sense what's in focus and then it affects the rest of the frame. It's not sensing depth. It's just being like, here's the subject and then we'll blur everything else. So, but it might still come in handy if you have that feature on your phone. And then on the second picture, I have the, these mushrooms. I also love taking pictures of mushrooms. And in this scenario, the midground is what's in focus. The foreground and background are out of focus. And what I really like about this, because you know, you see some little mushrooms in the foreground out of focus, it kind of feels like I'm down in the humus with that de decaying leaves and parts of trees. So I just feel like I'm more involved in that shot, it feels a little more intimate. And so I like the feeling that that sense of depth gives this image. And I think my last composition tip is leading lines. And so this means like having a strong line in your photo that guides the viewer's eye through the frame. So in this first one with Virginia bluebells on this path, I might be following the path upwards and then maybe looking up um, through one of these tree trunks. And then the second picture of these sunflowers I might be looking at the sunflower that's in focus, and then I'm gonna follow this little pattern of um, bright sunflowers through the frame. And so what's good about leading lines is that you don't get, uh, you don't just 
understand the whole image all at once. You kind of have to explore it. And I think that makes it more interesting. So just a quick recap of composition, um, just some steps to consider. You find your subject, maybe try out the rule of thirds, see if that helps or not. And then maybe consider the background, try a fresh perspective, get low or rotate yourself, try a fun angle, and then create a sense of depth when possible. If you see something really interesting in the background too, you know, frame it so you can see both the foreground and the background. And then if you find any leading lines, take advantage of that and incorporate that into your image as well. And with just these composition tips, this applies to any kind of camera, an iPhone, a mid-range digital camera, or a higher range DSLR. Um, so it doesn't matter what camera you have, I encourage you to think about some of these things. Now talking about exposure. Uh, exposure, having the right exposure is another key feature of having really high quality image, images. And so exposure is the amount of light that reaches your camera sensor. And so I think we've heard this word before, if something's underexposed, it tends to be dark. If it's overexposed, it tends to be too bright. And when you're at either extreme, you tend, you're losing some information. And so in your editing software, maybe if it's too dark, you can bring it up a little brighter, but if it's so, so dark, you've kind of lost information and you can't fix that in editing. So that's why it's important to try to get uh, mid-range exposure or proper exposure. And if you have an iPhone or even any other camera, um, iPhone will kind of always be in like auto mode where it's going to automatically adjust this exposure for you and try to get proper exposure. If you have other cameras, um, you can put it in auto mode, then you can also put it in manual mode. So you can adjust the certain um, components that affect exposure, which we'll talk about. And then, so if you're in manual mode and you have a, um, a DSLR or like a camera, photo specific camera, it'll have a light meter to tell you if it's over or underexposed. Um, proper exposure, you'll kind of be in this zero range. If it's overexposed, you'll be towards this plus sign. If it's underexposed, you'll be towards the minus sign. And then exposure is influenced by the amount of light outside. So whatever the sun's given us that day, but also the aperture and the shutter, which I'll talk briefly about because this doesn't always apply to having a phone camera and it also gets pretty technical. So aperture is the opening in the lens that lets light into the camera. Um, it's, it's like your pupil. Our eyes are kind of like mini cameras in a sense. And so the bigger, uh, the hole is the more light that gets let in, the smaller that hole or aperture is, the less light that gets in. So what's important to know is that aperture also has an aesthetic impact on your image because it directly controls something called the depth of field. And that's the area of your frame that's in focus. So in this first, or this image in the lower corner of a black saddlebag dragonfly, this has a really open, big aperture, and which means that the depth of field is really shallow. And so that's why it has that super blurry background. So bigger aperture, the shallow depth of field, which means it has a blurry background in this case. And the second picture right here, everything is in focus that I can see. And it, that means it has a really small aperture and a really deep depth of field. And for demonstration purposes, here's that royal catch fly again. And if you have a big aperture, it's going to be really blurry background. The smaller, more is going to be in focus. And this is kind of confusing, but the smaller the aperture number is actually the bigger the hole or the bigger the aperture. The bigger the aperture number, the smaller the hole, the more that's in focus. That's a little confusing because it's a ratio, but just kind of to remember it's opposite. Okay, so the second component to exposure is shutter. And aperture and shutter work hand in hand. If you have a really big aperture, 
it's going to be really bright because you're letting all that light in. So you have to balance it out with a short shutter that lets a little bit of light in. So shutter speed is the amount of time that the lens is open. Um, so if your shutter, if your lens is only, is open for a very short amount of time, less light, if it's open for longer, more light. And shutter speed is directly related to time in that sense. So if you have a longer shutter speed, this means you're actually capturing more time in your camera. And it's going to capture any movement that happens in that duration. So if you have a long shutter speed, it's going to also capture some motion if your subject is moving. So the difference between these two pictures of this hummingbird is that in the first one, it has a longer shutter speed. So we're getting some of the blur of the hummingbird's wings. We're seeing that motion. In the second one, it has a fast shutter and it's freezing the motion of the hummingbird's wings. And that can be really important and affect your image greatly. If you have a long shutter speed and you're just holding your camera, the image might also get blurry because it's um, kind of recording you, even if it's a, a slight shake, it's gonna capture that shakiness. So that's where a tripod is really handy. So if you're doing something that requires a longer shutter speed, maybe you're taking a picture of a landscape like that one we saw at Jay Woods Forest Preserve a few slides back, where everything was in focus, you need a small aperture, but then everything's dark. Um, so then you'd need to balance it out with the longer shutter. And to avoid that camera shake, you need a tripod. Another thing that, expect, uh, that impacts exposure is ISO. It's just the sensitivity of your camera, um, camera sensor. The higher the number, the more sensitive. But as you boost that higher and higher, you're going to start to get a lot of grain. And again, this is just on cameras that you can be in manual mode and adjust these. But on your phone camera, there is a little bit you can um, change with exposure. So if you, I know for sure in iPhones, this is a screenshot of an iPhone. If you go in and tap the screen, where you tap is where you decide what the camera will focus on. And then also will automatically adjust the exposure to every area you tap. But if you tap it, this little sun also appears and you can swipe up, the image will get brighter, it's letting more light in. If you swipe down, it'll get darker, it's letting less light in. So even if you're taking pictures on a phone, there's usually some way that you can adjust the exposure. So again, just to recap, exposure is affected by just the amount of available light as well as uh, the aperture and the shutter, which both affect the aesthetic quality of the image and then the ISO. And so here on this camera, all cameras are different, um, but here's the shutter speed, the aperture, and uh, the ISO. Okay, so what I've talked about, you can apply to any kind of photography, but there are certain things you wanna consider specifically for outdoor photography. First of all, um, you as a photographer can have an impact on the wildlife you're trying to take a picture of. And so we want to do our best not to disturb wildlife. So if you're looking up, looking for birds and not paying attention to what's below you, you might be trampling plants. So try not to do that, pay attention. And then also maintain enough distance between yourself and your subject, such as a bird, that you're letting it behave naturally. Don't disrupt its natural behaviors. Um, and this is where having a really nice zoom lens, you can be far away, but still get close to your subject with a zoom lens, like that comes in handy then. And so that's where you might wanna invest in a nice one. And then if you're taking pictures more at night, trying to get some nocturnal animals, don't use a flash, because that will again, disrupt their behavior, but also, Maybe you might think using bird call apps to try to lure in a certain bird that you want to take a picture of. That might sound like a good idea, but again, that's disrupting its natural behavior. It might think its territory is being threatened and can cause undue stress. And as nature photographers, we're trying, you know, we're appreciating nature. We're trying to show others how beautiful nature can be. We don't want to have a negative impact. And then also, um, since our sun is our light source in outdoor photography, the time of day we take our pictures is important. 
So if you're looking for a specific subject, you definitely need to consider what time of day is your subject active. Like if you're taking a picture for an insect, you know, they might kind of be sleepy when it's colder in the morning, so you want to wait till it's warm, they've warmed up and are active. But also the quality of light changes depending on where the sun is because it rises in the east and sets in the west. And so while it's moving through the sky, it has creates different qualities of light, which can create drastically different moods. So I just want to show an example of how the sun can change the quality of the light. So in these first two pictures, this is really early in the morning. The sun is just starting to come up, um, peek up over the horizon and the trees. So it's barely even hitting our subjects, which is this monarda or bee balm and common milkweed. But it is kind of creating a nice little glowiness in the background. We have a little bit of a lens flare coming in, which happens when you're shooting into your light source. Some people like that. Some people don't, um, personal preference. Also, if you're shooting really early in the morning, you might get some nice little dew drops, as you can see in this one with the milkweed. That's a bonus. And then, so as the sun is rising, it's still, though, um, coming from the side. So you're getting this really directional light that creates long shadows and adds a lot of dimension to your images. So I really like shooting at this time, and a lot of other people do, too. The hour after sunrise and then the hour before sunset is called golden hour. And this tends to create really warm, some people say, oh, it's a magical kind of light. It just tends to look really nice, pleasing. And so you might want to try that, that out, shooting at golden hour. Um, so here we can see that these spruce trunks are being hit by the side. It's a nice warm quality of light. And then these two pictures are shot during midday, but um, the cloud coverage is different. In this first image, it's really bright. Uh, there were some clouds, but it was pretty much directly hitting these plants. So everything's so bright. And if you look at this common milkweed, you can see some sharp shadows. That's what happens if it's a really bright day. And the second picture of this echinacea um, had thick clouds, it was overcast, and this diffuses the light and look at how um, nice and soft these shadows are. So one's not necessarily better than the other, but it produces different, a different quality image. And then the direction um, of the light source can also affect the image. This is the same clump of wild leeks, but one we're shooting with the sun at the back, which is the first one, the other, the um, so the first one we're shooting into the sun, so it's backlighting the leaks. And um, the second picture, it's lighting it from the front. I, I tend to like shooting um, into the sun, so having it backlit, it just looks better to me, but it just depends on what you like. And then maybe the most important tip for nature photography is patience. <laughs> uh, this is because nature doesn't take direction. If we see a red-tailed hawk sitting in a branch, we can't just say, okay, hold it, now shift your head to the left a little bit, perfect, and like take the perfect shot. It doesn't work that way. So this means that you might have to go out multiple times to the same spot or just sit really quietly so you're not spooking your subject. Um, you just sit quietly enough to where they forget about you and maybe land right in front of you. Um, this is an extreme example of this, are nature photographers who take a, try to take pictures of Siberian tigers. They will like go in these little bunkers or basically sometimes like crates, like I think it's like a five, what one I've seen is like a five by eight room and they stay in there for like six days at a time and don't leave because Siberian tigers are so sensitive to any kind of human just influence, like they will run away or if they see you, they'll attack you. So, you know, all it takes uh, to take a picture of a Siberian tiger is to bunker down in Siberia for months at a time and not leave your little bunker. But that's just an extreme example. Um, for here, it's just being patient and not uh, getting too close to the different wildlife. And it might just take you several times to get the shot you want. And then how you frame your photo what aperture and what shutter you take 
um, shutter you select can add more meaning to your photo and can give it a slight narrative slant. And this is really subtle, or it can be subtle. So what I mean by this is like, here's this um, picture of Waterfall Glen, and uh, it has a longer shutter speed. So we're seeing that blur in the movement of the water. And so it's telling us that this is, like, you can see the movement of the water, and that's kind of part of that narrative element. In the picture of the dragonfly again, uh, this is, it's so, the background's so blurry that we're kind of losing any context of where this dragonfly is. He seems kind of isolated. So maybe if I wanted to include more information where this dragonfly is, I would make the background less blurry, uh, reduce my aperture so I can give it more context. Um, you could also do something more direct if you want to do like a photo series, maybe a before and after of habitat restoration. That's a way to tell that story. And we'll talk very briefly about photo editing, because um, that could be a course in and of itself. But you popular ways to edit your pictures are Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop, but these cost money. They're subscription based. On your phone, there's hundreds of free apps. Um, I like Afterlight is what I sometimes use, but also just start with what you have. The default editing on phones and on your computer are often good enough. They will have many of the main um, features to edit your photos. And some of those are um, just the, the ability to crop your pictures, um, maybe balancing the color if things kind of got out of whack your exposure. So if it's a little dark, you want to add some light to it to bring it back up. Contrast and then vibrance or saturation. So um, here's an example of some of that. Uh, kind of going to extremes here, but a high contrast image versus a low contrast image. High vibrance, which is kind of like saturation, but a little bit more subtle. So I like to use that one more than saturation, and then a low vibrance or low um, desaturated image, and then clarity, which is like contrast, um, except it's affecting midtones, not just the brights and the darks. So again, this is very brief because I don't have much time with you today, but what I encourage you to do is take some pictures, edit them, go to extremes, so then you can pull back and see what you like and just get to know it through experience. So here's an example of a picture that I edited. Um, took this picture of a monarch on a spruce tree and the original kind of far away because it's the closest I could get to it without scaring the monarch. Um, it's a little low contrast. So I, I cropped in to get closer to it. And if you have a high quality um, camera or if you have an, a new phone these days, you can crop in without losing much quality. So that's really nice. And then I increased the contrast and then added a little bit more vibrance to boost those colors. And the second picture of these sunflowers again, notice how subtle this is. This is how I would edit this picture. It's just increasing the exposure a little bit, maybe that vibrance and contrast. And I really like a subtle approach when it comes to taking nature photography because I think nature is, you know, it's already beautiful and I, I want to represent it as it is. So just showing like a truthful representation of what I saw. I don't want to make it look too hyper real. But again, that's just my opinion. Much of photo editing is personal preference. The, the difference between these two isn't great, but you can see in the first one, it's a little bit more punchy. It has it's higher contrast. Um, the colors are skewed a little bit different in these two, but which one you like better is just personal preference in this case. So you've taken a great photo. You've edited it a little bit, and now you want to share it with the world. What do you do? Of course, there's social media to share with your friends and family, but there's also specific Facebook groups just for nature photography or you know, specific just for bird photography if you're into that, and also Instagram hashtags you can follow to just find specific pictures. And then there are a lot of nature photography contests too, especially with forest preserves. I know Will County Forest Preserve in Illinois is doing a what they call preserve the moment um, contest that goes to the end of the year and there are cash prizes so that's kind of fun if you don't live in or near will county look at your local forest preserve 
from what I've saw, I know DuPage, Cook County, most of the ones around here often do um, nature photography contests. And this just in, the Conservation Foundation is holding their own nature photography contest to celebrate this webinar. We're still setting it up, but we're gonna come out with it on Friday and it's going to be specific to phone nature photography because most of us have a smartphone that can take great pictures and just you can incorporate some of these tips to take great pictures. It doesn't matter what camera you have, as I said earlier. And then just a small caveat to sharing your pictures is this question, what happens when nature goes viral? As social media has become just a way bigger part of our lives than we ever imagined it, uh, it has some interesting consequences. People love to go out to just like really great vistas and landscapes and take a nice portrait of themselves standing in a field of flowers. So that actually is happening in California, the California poppy super bloom. Um, people shared, took those pictures, shared the location, and then now people want to go recreate that picture. And so they, because they shared the location, they know exactly where it is. They're going out there and people aren't staying on the trails because they want to be right in the flowers. So they're going off the trail, trampling those flowers. And then with this other one with the waterfall, it used to be a really unknown site. Someone took a picture, shared that location, and now a lot of tourists go there and there was no amenity set up for it. So now people are using the bathroom just like in the bushes and it's affecting like local kids' ability just to play around there. So we can have um, these unintended consequences when nature goes viral. And so if you're taking a picture in a sensitive or protected location, or you took a picture of an endangered bird or threatened plant, it's wise to not disclose the location because unfortunately not everyone treats nature with the respect it deserves. So what makes a great nature photo? At a fundamental level, it's having a really clear subject uh, a well-considered composition that has proper exposure. So incorporating um, some of the tips I shared with you, you can get that. But it also really depends on your purpose. If you are taking pictures for you know, identification reasons, some people are birders and they wanna you know, have photo evidence of what they've taken. You wanna, it, that photo is gonna be really different than a photo taken for more aesthetic artistic reasons. So here's this royal catch fly again. Um, it's a really clear image of the flowers. I think it'd be really good for IDing the flowers, but it's not the most interesting picture in terms of like artistic quality. Um, but also an image, you might be using photography to send a message or to have an impact. And in that case, nature might not be beautiful. Like what you're trying to portray, maybe you wanna show habitat degradation and try to boost support to protect local land, you know, that's going to be a lot different than if you're just trying to show how the beauty of nature. Or you might just be taking pictures just to get outside more, be creative, just for fun, and so you don't really care about the outcome, you just enjoy the process of taking pictures. I think that's incredible too. So I just want to leave you with this. Ansel Adams is one of the most well-known photographers out there. He's a landscape photographer. And in the 30s, he took pictures of Kings Canyon in California. He had an exhibition showing all these pictures and he showed people how amazing this land was. And it was that gallery of his photos that was crucial in making Kings Canyon a national park and protected that land forever. So that, I just wanted to leave you with that, that nature photography can be really fun and creative. It can also be powerful and have a real impact and maybe taking pictures at local places will encourage our community to protect local nature. So that's all that uh, I have for today. Really hope you learned a few things to help you take better nature photos. Feel free to email me. My email is lrodberry at theconservationfoundation.org. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Fantastic. That was awesome, Leah. Thank you so much. I learned a ton. Great. So hopefully I can take some of these, these tips and tricks that you gave us to heart and maybe not be the world's worst photographer anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> great.
Um, okay, so we do have, I, I see one question in the Q&A box. So remember, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and throw them in that Q&A box and we'll go ahead and start with the questions now. So um, Anonymous asks, I'm a little confused on how ISO works. How should you alter your ISO in relation to your shutter and aperture? Okay, great. So I didn't go into detail on this just because it starts to get more technical, but since you asked, we're going to go into it. So ISO, um, it basically controls how sensitive your camera sensor is. So the greater the ISO number is, the brighter the image is going to be, the lower that number is, the darker your image is, is going to be because if you're lowering it, you're making your sensor less sensitive. And this goes, ties back into film photography with film stocks. So if you ever took film photos, um, you can get like a 100 speed film um, versus a 400 speed film. The 400 speed film, if you're referring to that ISO, that one um, is more sensitive. You can take your film photos in darker places. That's where it comes from. But in relation to aperture and shutter, so if you, um, here's just an example, if you don't have a tripod, it's getting dark outside, and so you, you want to put your shutter as long as you can without having that camera shake, um, but then your aperture, you've opened your aperture, aperture all the way, uh, but your image is still dark, that might, you might want to boost your ISO a little bit. So if you that have any follow-up little, questions. That, that was the little sun that was on the, the iPhone too that you could, said you could raise and lower? I'm not exactly sure what that's adjusting. Um, but it does adjust overall exposure. So I'm not exactly sure what that is. I, I, I do kind of think that might be the sensitivity, but yeah. I'd always seen it and I never knew what that was. And so it's really cool and know that that's something I can adjust now. So very Yeah, cool. I don't, had always seen it too in the past, but just swipe up or swipe down and you'll notice your image get brighter or darker. Um, Terry brings up the point that different phones, and he specifically mentions iPhones, uh, or um, can be, or I, iPhone Plus, mm. I think he's saying, it is, can be better than other phones. Basically, the point here is different phones have different quality cameras. My husband's an app developer, and uh, his app involves using the camera to take an image of a piece of paper. And the variation that's out there in phones, like he's had to actually go out and buy a whole bunch of different phones just to be able to test how his app works on all these, you know, with all the different cameras that are on them. So yeah, know that, you know, I ha just, I have an iPhone 7, I think. And if somebody's got the iPhone 10, that camera is going to be different from mine, even though it's the same manufacturer. And an Android camera is going to be completely different on top of that. So, um, it, it just really all depends on on your phone and and what's going on with that. So yeah, completely. I know the the iPhone Plus, I believe, and definitely the newer ones like the iPhone 11, they have even multiple cameras on the phone. Right. So right. the difference is is like the newest ones have three cameras, kind of insane. And that's just they're basically just different lenses. One's wide, one's a super wide, and one's a more zoom telephoto. So now with like the newer and newer phones, like they're incorporating a lot of the features that were in like photo specific cameras. And I bet that's just good. They're just gonna keep getting better and better. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jenny asked, do you recommend never using a flash with nature photography? I'd like to take pictures of family raccoons that I see near where I live often, but since they tend to only show up when it's getting dark or is dark, do you have suggestions? Also their eye shine shows up if I do use a flash, so. Oh, good point. Yeah, it like uh, <laughs> when you use a flash, it's um, the light is bouncing off their retinas and shooting back at you. Uh, so you, you'd you have to edit that digitally. That's that same thing where you can do like the, where people's eyes will turn red with a flash. And so there's actually in a lot of editing software, there's like an auto feature where you select the eye and it'll turn it back to black. So you have to do something like that. Um, Interesting to note, though, since we're while we're on the topic of eye shine, um, eye shine is actually a way to help identify animals because different animals' eye shine is different colors. 
So I've actually seen a chart that shows different animals and what color their eye shine is. That's fascinating. I did not it's, know that. It's super cool, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of flash, it's just, I don't know, it's being kind of considerate to wildlife and not using it to disrupt their behavior. Raccoons, I'm, I don't know. Jamie, I'm not sure what you think about disrupting them with light. They often do experience other light leakages from other just development. Well, so. it, the only issue that I can I can really see with it, and, and it is a, a, a pretty big issue, is just like at night, if somebody takes a flash picture of you, you are temporarily blinded. The same goes with the animals, except there's a lot bigger consequences to that. So if the animal is temporarily blinded, they can't defend themselves if a predator is around. So um, really being considerate to, to prevent that. You know, we have rods and cones in our eyes and they release a chemical called rhodopsin that helps us to see better in the dark. And as soon as light hits that rhodopsin, it's destroyed. And that's why we get blinded when somebody turns on a flashlight or flashes a flashlight in our eyes at night. Um, cool night hike things that I used to do when I was a naturalist. So. <laughs> yeah, eyes, again, like I said, they're so similar to cameras. So what's happening is it's getting darker. Our rods and cones are specifically, it's one of the, the rods are more active at night, um, get a lot more sensitive to light. Uh, so now all of a sudden the light's changing so fast and our eyes can't adjust for it. Um, yeah, exactly. So, I, so that, that is the difficulty with shooting with animals, uh, shooting pictures with animals. And so I think maybe this would go back to using maybe a, a, wider, a wider aperture then to let in more light so that you don't mm -hmm. have to use the flash perhaps. And you could use a tripod and have a longer shutter as long as they're not moving really fast. Um, might help you get a little bit more light in. Uh, full moon, there's a huge difference at night. So yeah, yeah. Depending on the moon, that might be something. And then if you if you're not in too urban place where the moon's actually having an effect. Yeah. yeah, and you know, and and this doesn't just hold for raccoons. This would also hold for owls and things like that too. So using flash with them can can really be pretty destructive. You know, that owl um, depends very strongly on their eyesight. Um, owls can see effectively like one candle power, they can see an entire football field. Like they have just this amazing night vision because their eyes, if our eyes were the same um, like relative size to our head that an owl's is, our eyes would be the size of tennis balls. So owl's eyes are huge so that they can get that really large aperture so they can see at night really, really well. Putting a flash on an owl, that's gonna really not permanently damage, but temporarily damage their eyesight, make them unable to hunt, unable to see what's going on. They may you know, try and fly and crash into something. It, so definitely you know, wanna watch out for that. Yeah, and Flash, it's, it's uncomfortable just being a, a human. So you can maybe sympathize with them if you've ever had that Flash. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, Jennifer wants to know, I take a lot of DSLR photos, but when it pertains to an iPhone, how close do you get to your subject? I think it just depends on what the subject is because you can't get really close to a bird with an iPhone, it's gonna mm -hmm. fly away. If um, that picture I showed early on with that trout lily, I was so close to it, so the phone and the, yeah. the trout lily. Um, what's really cool about phones is that they can, most of them can focus really close versus on some um, lenses I have with my bigger camera, it can't focus as close. So that's something. Um, I'm not quite sure what, the, what she's asking about specifically. Just you can get as close as you can without disturbing the subject, making it fly away um, or disrupting its behavior. You can do a lot uh, of zoom too, even on an iPhone. Yeah, on a phone maybe camera. that's like one thing to consider it, if you do zoom with your phone, don't zoom too much because then you start to lose quality. So it is that balance between how close can you get without making, you know, disrupting your subject and then, but also not zooming too much on a 
phone where you're losing quality. You kind of have to figure out where that is. And if yeah, you have it's, a, it's a balancing phone, act. Mm-hmm, phone, you can crop in later. True. Um, something. It's yeah, just and- yeah, balance putting all of those. Her follow-up just said, I feel like I have to be right on top of mine for my phone to be clear. So I would think, you know, using that where you tap the image or, mm-hmm. you, you know, you tap where your subject is on the phone and that will help it to focus a little bit better mm-hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, focusing on something else in the field. That's a problem I find I have a lot if I'm taking a picture of a flower of getting the flower to be in focus and not that like piece of grass that's right in front of it. Yeah, but I, I agree. Um... When I'm using my phone, I'm right on top of it too, just because I don't want to use that digital zoom as much. Right, right. Um, yeah, and, and you lose the quality. It's a, phones have wide lenses, so you're going to see a lot more. They're great for landscapes, um, but when you want to get really close and get that monarch butterfly really close, you have to, yeah, it's that game of tra- how close can you get. All right, and Jamin has a question. How do you take a photo of a moving object or a bird? Oh, I, I skipped that part of my presentation. I was just referenced, referenced really briefly something called burst mode um, in the part where it was uh, just consideration specific to nature photography. If you have a moving subject uh, that's, and you want it to be crisp and clear, you need that really short shutter speed. And then something you can also do on phones, uh, any, any digital camera and DSLRs, there's something called burst mode that it will take a sequence of images really rapidly. And that's something that's so helpful for a moving subject, especially like a bird flying through the sky, is that it might take 10 pictures instead of one. And then you can go through those images and maybe see where its wings are positioned the way you want it to. I've used that as well, taking pictures of a butterfly who's got its wings closed and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for them to open up and I can never just hit that button right on time. So I've used the burst mode and then when they do that, then you got it. Yeah, so if that's worked for you, that's really great. And it's on phones, just holding down that shutter button. um, You know, that's what I've seen. It triggers the burst mode. Um, My iPhone does that. Taking pictures of moving subjects is also about patience. (laughs) Because, yeah, they're not going to perform exactly how you want it to. So you might have to take a lot of pictures with, with, um, with digital photography. Now we can just take thousands and thousands of pictures. That's where patience comes into it, too. For sure. All right. Well, that was all the questions that I see. If there are no more questions, I think we will wrap it up for the day. Great. Thank you so much, Leah. For This was awesome. There, You had so much really great information here. I know I learned a ton. Um, I'm seeing lots of of thank yous in the chat, so um, it sounds like everybody else enjoyed it as well. So uh, thank you all for coming out today. This, uh, you know, fun as always. We hope to see you out again next week for Oaks, our A-O-K-K, and the following week for our talk on Illinois raptors, birds, not the dinosaurs. So (laughs) always got to be clear on that because you never know. Um, so again, thank you, Leah. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you again next week. Take care. Bye-bye.